Now, some of the what was accomplished through that retreat was that um, Lama Pema tells us about it. His body acquired great radiance, sign that he had received the blessings of body. As a result of the speech blessing, he did not meet the slightest impediment in his activities of teaching, writing, or religious debate. And as for the blessing of mind, he was unshakable in his meditation. He could direct his vital energy wherever he chose to. He had limitless compassion and possessed complete and hindered clairvoyance. There were some external signs too, such as his battle lamps would never went out after that in his place. The water in the offering bowls would turn into milk. Uh, the Amrita would boil. And rainbows would appear on the traumas. And long life pills may start floating freely, not just in his room, but also outside. So you can imagine what impression that made on other people around him. Uh, another sign of um, spiritual holiness that you find sometimes in some beings is his body had what they call the delicate scent of pure contact. Somebody who keeps very pure contact all the time is a very special kind of subtle scent. And he had a very, very pleasant smell on his breath. So for him, there was no longer, like for us, most of us, a time when we meditate and a time after meditation, post-meditation stage. For him, his whole life was that state of perfect meditation in the sense that there was no longer a difference between him and others, no longer between mind and appearances. He was in that state of complete meditation in the sense of realization. So by that time he became very renowned for his achievements. Um, we'll be able to say most important things. Yeah, one thing that I shouldn't forget to mention is that for all these uh, meditation accomplishments, he was very, very present to people around him, to their requests, to their needs, to their um, wishes even. And that's when I read that, I thought, gosh, it really reminds me of someone. <laughs> because he was always ready to give people what they needed, when they needed it, and how they needed it. Um, it says that very clearly in the text, and um, also without discrimination, whether they be young, old, um, men, women, they get what they were capable of taking in. So that even sometimes someone who might look that they were fairly new in the practice, if they were ready, he would give them deeper instructions. And uh, if somebody else needed a lot of other things, he gave them, give it to them. That generosity, generosity was a real trait of this, this person, uh, both materially and spiritually. So materially, whatever he had that was given, he immediately used it to help people. He was very sensitive to people who were um, without protectors who were destitute, who were in need, and always trying to help them. Again, we have an echo of what we've known. And uh, he was, but he used some of his resources also when he had some to, again, you won't be surprised, to build and to make beautiful images uh, for Domalakon. Uh, which means that, you know, for all his 
People sometimes think if someone is realized, and he's O'Leary Ferry, he was, and he was on the contrary, extremely present. That's what true realization is, present to others and their needs. And so he was aware of what was needed and did it when it was needed. And whenever he gave advice, it was always um, like our Rinpoche, very, very, on the face of it, looking, looking like very simple advice, but that goes to the heart of people about how it's important to remain in harmony. Like in those days, it was a, it was a monastic community, so it was telling them that um, they should keep harmony between uh, between themselves in the monastic community. Um, you must live in harmony together, keep a pure discipline, and preserve the continuity of your three trainings. And also, often talking about impermanence, about death, always reminding people of this. It seems, and that's a great pity, that he wrote quite a few Doha's spiritual uh, poems, songs, and unfortunately, um, they were mostly lost. So there were just little fragments left here and there. Uh, it says at one point, when, when he's, he's willing to give anything that people need, like if they need Dharma, he gives them Dharma. If they want obstacles removed, he removes obstacles. If they want empowerments, he gives them empowerments. If they want talks, he gives them talks. Um, gives blessings, and it's, there's no end to his generosity. But accord, always according to what people need for their own progress. So that's for his amazing generosity. Now, at this point, I have to talk about the time flies so much. At 40, he had uh, what, what Lama Pema calls an awakening of his uh, previous knowledge in his mind. In other words, we can also think of it as when a mind is totally uh, pure and understands and perceives the fabric of things, then knowledge comes very spontaneously. So anyway, when he was 40, he, his knowledge of medicine became totally full and very important. And of course, he had some training as part of the five sciences when he was a student, but there it took a completely different level. And it says that he was able to um, understand always what was um, ailing someone and what was needed to heal them, to re-establish the balance. And he had full command of the uh, remedies and medicines that could be used uh, in this particular instance. However, the Namta being what it is, it does, doesn't give us any details. We'd love to have details on all that. It doesn't say anything. It only speaks on the side of um, using his medical skills to help, but more on the spiritual side. And the, he actually trained three persons in medicine and made them promise that they would never charge people who didn't have resources and give medicines and treatment for free. Because in Tibet, people used to give lavishly in order to get treatment. They would really even go in debt for that. They would give cattle, they would give grain, they would give uh, cotton, wool, silk, whatever. They had very expensive presents. And he said to them, when you are a doctor, you just give to whoever needs treatment and you give them what they need, the treatment and the medicines, and you don't charge. And they took the uh, promise to do that. And it says after that that they could, through that, they were able to help a lot of people and be of great use. But he himself 
Okay. He himself uh, became renowned for the way he was able to help people. And one of the big um, stories is that it's connected to uh, control machine. Now here we're talking about control chance user who was known at the time as Kasi Kuntu. Kasi meaning son of Kamapa. Now the 15th Kamapa, Kacha Doji, as some of you might know, um, was married and had a son. His son was this Kasi, son of Kamapa, Kasi Kuntu. And uh, Kasi Kuntu was very important because not only was he uh, very advanced spiritually, but also the 15th Kamapa passed on to him all the lineage teachings, special empowerments and instructions, which means that in turn, the Kase control will have to pass that on to the next Kamapa, which was the 16th Kamapa, Rikpe Doji, that some of us knew. So he was a very important person because of that. And it so happened that at one stage he was um, in the area of Tsawagon, not far from Domarakon. And uh, the story goes that at one point he became, um, well, he had already left the area to go to a place, uh, a Jonon place, not far from there. And he became violently Ill. Ill. It seems he had a very nasty dream of something incredibly negative. And after that, he became violently ill. And they actually feared for his life. They dispatched someone, a messenger, to Parkum, where he had his seat, asking for prayers, for things to be done. And in all the monasteries of the whole area, they asked for prayers and rituals. And um, to no avail, it didn't seem to help much. And at that point, Kasi Kontru, who he and um, Kama Miu had met several times, uh, Kama Miu had received empowerments from him. And Kasi Kontru, who shortly before falling ill had gone through um, Domanakon, Kasi Kontru said uh, the only thing to do is to call Kama Miu to come, ask him to come. And um, if, if, he, if he comes and he can do something, then I, I'm confident that I will get over this. So they went, his entourage went to ask uh, Lama Akong, as he was known, or Kama Miyo, to come over. He came over with a party of 20 monks who were occupied and doing rituals. He put all the people in retreat to do rituals also for Kase uh, Kontru, but he himself uh, actually, it is Kasi Kontru. Kasi Kontru said, I'm convinced that if Kama Miyo can give me empowerments every day, I will get better. Now, Kama Miyo was an incredibly uh, modest person. I said, how could I give empowerments to you? <laughs> I cannot give empowerments to you. And Kasi Kontru insisted and said, come on, you have to. So, uh, Kama Miyo gave him empowerments every day for a uh, fairly long period of time, some weeks, while all the other rituals were going on that he was in, he'd instructed other people what to do. And after uh, some time, Kasi Kontru started to recover, and he recovered fully, to the point where he was able to leave the place where he was then on horseback. And he went to another place where he rested some more before going home. But before he left, uh, he was accompanied at the time by the 10th Trumpa, who was a very important uh, person in, in, the, in the story at that time. And actually, the 10th Trumpa uh, was um, the guru of Kasi Kontru. So they were going together back to Papu. And just before they left, uh, Kasi Kontru said, um, if I'm able now to go back and to uh, take a seat where I can help people, it is 
thanks to this Lama, he said, showing Kamameyo. And later on, he uh, gave Kamameyo the... Uh, he said that Kamameyo was the same as himself, which is about the highest um, compliment you can pay anyone. And through that, a lot of uh, respect and honors came to Kamameyo, who didn't want them, but couldn't refuse them. And this, this turned out to have been an incredibly important thing, not just because it saved the life of such a lineage holder as uh, Kasi Kontru, but because this is what determined that later on um, he, we have a tulku. And this is how it goes. I skip a whole lot of things because there's no time. And then we come to the point where uh, Kamamiyo comes from doing some funeral um, rites for the mother of the Dege King. And uh, when he comes back home, he's suddenly taken, he, takes very, he becomes very young, well, very suddenly. Uh, 